Today we're going to do something a little bit different. We have gone through the color chart um, many different times in many different ways. We've done it from um, alpha A to Z. We've done it through um, uh, by by color. By we've done it by groups. So I think we would do something a little bit different. And last time I was in uh, Germany, uh, Michael Solvay was also in Germany, and he had agreed at, to do a small presentation to about 50 artists. And what he did is he went over his dot card and he explained to the artists why he chose the dot cards, what made them special, um, how they could use them. It was uh, more of explanation. And I thought that would be absolutely wonderful to um, go through for each of the brand ambassadors that have, have made a dot card. So over the next many number of weeks, 30 minutes is going to be given to um, a brand ambassador to introduce themselves, to show you their dot card, to tell you what, what was their process, very difficult process, of choosing 18 out of 266 colors. Um, unless you were early on like Stella and there was less colors then, so probably even maybe a little bit more difficult. Um, and what, what makes it special? As you know, it, there can be um, opacity, some will love transparent colors, some will love standing colors. I just thought it was wonderful the way Michael did it. So Michael's going to be our um, kind of our example of what you'll see over the next following number of weeks. And so with that, I'd like you to introduce Michael Solvay, brand ambassador from Canada. Um, wonderful guy who's going to 23 different countries this year to do teaching. And with that, Michael, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this chance, John. And yeah, I will be happy to represent my dot card and explain uh, the idea. So honestly, uh, the dot card is not just a dot card. This is our palette. This is the colors what we're using to uh, create our, our art and the selection of the uh, of the pigments what we're using it's very important this is our palette so uh honestly i'm a lazy guy uh, i'm using uh, uh each for each painting like a, not more than six or seven paints that's it for each project but uh, depends on the project for sure it's slightly different so uh you never find my artwork where I use all of them. And honestly, my set is just 10 colors. So that, that's the set. And uh, that's mostly what I'm using. For all the mixes, for all the projects, I use that 10 basic mix. Other colors I use just for some uh, special effects, like if I need a granulation or uh, I like a Primatech colors, but I not use them for the regular mixes. It's just for the some special effects for the background for the you know if we go into the angela favorite city girona and want to paint the old walls i'm going to the prima tech colors which make a very nice texture but it's not like a for the regular everyday job so uh, i want to introduce your idea how i built my my palette how i built my dot card and explain the selection first of all uh, uh in my hand unfortunately it's the first card uh, it's the old one because the new one gone on my uh, last workshop all of them so the list what you can see in the chat uh, not exactly right a few colors i stopped to use and switch to other one and i explain the reason for sure so uh step by step let's start and i will uh, i will explain the uh, idea of the selection and it will be better if i use just the uh, tubes for that so uh, first of all, uh, then I build my palette. Uh, it's, you know, it's a part of the, uh, like a classical education. Uh, the few colors we couldn't escape. It's what we call primary color. This is alizarin crimson. It should be on our palette because that color is impossible to mix. It's truly primary color. And, you know, I do my best to keep all the pigments, what I'm use, all the paints transparent. For me, it's very important. In that case, if uh, you know, remember in watercolor, we're painting mostly by dirty water. So if I mix all my pigments together in that, it still will be a nice mix if all of them transparent. So the, for me, it's a very important point. And that uh, I can say the second uh, 
primary color. This is the Indian yellow. Uh, this is the most powerful and the bright yellow color what you can find on our planet. And compared to the uh, mostly uh, yellow pigments what you can find in the tubes, this is 100% transparent because mostly it's like cadmium pigments, they are not transparent for sure. So the Elysium crimson transparent as well. So that two primary colors have to be in our palette uh, always. And the biggest problem to make the right selection for the blue color. In the some books, you can find information that primary blue color is ultramarine, cobalt or something. Honestly, if you look at your printer, uh, you will find that. This is the uh, tallow blue green shade. That's exactly what our printers charge it. And that's truly primary color. Honestly, uh, then we're talking about the primary colors. Remember what we have in our printers, that's the terrible chemical stuff. Then we're talking about the Daniel Smith, we're talking about the natural pigments and the good quality. No one pigments a uh, real primary. They can be very close to what we have in the printers, but it's not the same. It's the real stones, nice pigments. It's not the chemical things from our printers. That's why, uh, you know, the quality is quite different. So. From my point of view, if we have to be honest, the real blue primary color, it's something between a uh, tall blue green shade and the cobalt. So we need just a little bit cobalt inside to make the real primary. So that's my point of view for sure. So that guys uh, in my dot card, but uh, you know, if I'm stuck for sure, we can mix almost everything from that. But you know, it's a very complicated job to prepare a new mix all the time. That's why I want to introduce you three different pigments, what I call mine primary colors. The first one is my favorite color. This is the Queen of Crayon Sienna. I believe you know that color very well. So here is it, bright, colorful, uh, so nice. Uh, it's just amazing. I, I can tell you that color changed my style a lot. So this is the Pyrene Violet. Another one, incredible color, very rich, uh, very interesting. So here is it. And the last one, my personal primary color is Indigo. And you know what is interesting? Uh, for sure, this Queen of Sienna, it's not yellow, but kind of. This is not red, but close. And this is not blue color, but something. So uh, very uh, oranges, warm colors, cold colors. So they are close to that, but that colors give me a chance to make a very interesting mixes. And that's the point. And from my point of view, uh, the main thing, it doesn't matter how the color look like itself. Sometimes if I see the colors, you know, if I put uh, in my list, all the colors, what I like from the Daniel Smith, it will be more than 100, but you couldn't paint with that. So you have to make your selection. In another case, you uh, spend a lot of time to just squeeze your tubes, right? So. It, uh, idea is it doesn't matter how the color look like itself. It is important what mixes you can make from that color. How build the family, your personal family of your colors. That's important. That's why then the Daniel Smith create the new pigments uh, because they're digging, they create all the time something new, that's cool. And sometimes then they just pick up the new pigments and test them. Uh, I'm not thinking how nice that color. I'm thinking, how that color mixes with my basic colors. Is it possible to, for this pigment to be part of my family or not? So that's the important point. And another one, it's my personal point of view. You can be disagree, it's up to you for sure. Uh, all the traditions, how we mix the colors in watercolor and all the rules, what you can find in the <clears throat> almost all the books, from my point of view, completely wrong. It's not because I'm so smart. It's because all that traditions came from oil. For 400 years, 
we mix in watercolor pigments exactly like we did before with the oil and still doing the same. The Chinese people, the Japanese people mix your the colors in the completely different way. So that's why I'm starting to learn uh, from that guys because they, you know, the China make watercolor thousand years ago. So they know what to do with that. So then they mix the colors. They think in by completely different way. It's like a, a vitrage, you know, transparent glass. You put another one on top of another one and that's how we create the pigments. In the, uh, then we use the oil, we think in by completely different way. We don't have to put the transparent pigments on top of each other. We can use the white for that. So that's the difference. That's why the brown colors, the brown colors, burnt sienna, ochre, uh, rose sienna, all that guys, burnt amber, yeah. Normally, big part of our oil palettes. Yeah. All the education starting from the burnt amber, burnt sienna, rose sienna, ochre. And traditionally, we take the same uh, pigments using for mixes in watercolor. But the problem is, again, from my point of view, it's so all of them nice colors. They are not transparent. It's just the clay, you know, it's, it's the ground. They are not transparent. So finally, you couldn't make the bright, colorful mixes from that. That's why in my palette, the brown colors not exist at all. But the brown colors, it's a huge part of our paintings all the time. So instead of the use the brown from the tube, I mix them. Look, this is the Queen Sienna. This is the Indigo, right? So together, we have a very nice brown color immediately. And what is really cool, it's 100% transparent. If I want to make it a little bit more reddish, I can add inside pure and violet. So finally, the full range, what you can imagine with the brown colors, you can create from these three guides. Any ochre, any burn, uh, look like a burnt sienna, Burnt amber, everything what you can find in the classical tubes, you can mix from them. And again, this is a hundred percent transparent. And just imagine what the variation what you can create. Use just these six guys. I don't include here the green colors. That will be another one interesting story. Like for example, if we uh, mix in the basic mixes uh, for the human skin. Yeah, I miss one color, very important for me. Uh, this is the Quinecridon Deep Gold. Here is it. That's what I miss. And for me, it's a very nice, rich yellow color. It, it is yellow, you see, but it's very rich. It's not simple. It's uh, interesting, nice. So, for example, the uh, mix is for the human skin. Arisian Crimson, Deep Gold. Adam, we have it. So we can make it more yellowish, more pinkish, but again, it's a transparent mix. It's very nice for the uh, young ladies, for the kids. So if you go into the uh, adult people, um, we need a little bit uh, less colorful mixes. So instead of the deep gold, we can use Queen Sienna. Instead of the Alizan Crimson, Pure and Violet. And that's easily, we have another one variation of the human skin. You know, I like to paint the portrait. So that's the basic idea. So that guys always uh, mixes together. If we want to make something colder, you see that's easy to do with that cobalt everywhere. It's just make it grayish. And another one, uh, discovering what I make for myself and what I'm using, then I build my own palette. Uh, as you know, the Daniel Smith make the pigments uh, times to times special for the artist. And look how interesting is that. For the Joseph's Bookwich, uh, the Daniel Smith make Joseph's cool gray, Joseph's warm gray, Joseph's natural gray. For Al, uh, Alvaro Castagnet, Alvaro Fresca gray. For Lauren McCracken, McCracken black. All the artists looking for grayish mixes. That's important. And that's the difference between uh, one style and another one style. You know, if you want to paint the orange or banana in the light, you just can take the pigments from the tube and make it easily. The problem is how to make the shadow on banana. 
it's impossible to use the you know the you know the shadow should be cold. You couldn't use the blue colors. You will have a green. So the key is how to create the grayish yellow or yellowish gray color. That's interesting game. And uh, for my feeling, the uh, idea how fast, simple you can create the gray colors, and how interesting your gray colors for all the shadows because all the shadows less colorful compared to the bright part of the object. That's exactly how we built our palette. If you can do it very simple, use just two pigments from your palette, you're in a good shape. If you have to use a lot of pigments and spend like a 15 minutes to create the shadow, the gray color, what you're looking for, you know, your paper going to dry. You don't have a time for that. So it has to be done fast and simple. And the best example to explain uh, how we have to, from my point of view, again, how we have to think that we mix in colors, it's the green. So in my palette, I have just one green color, that one. This is a phthalo green blue shade. And uh, you know, itself, it's look very strange. Uh, that's why I say it doesn't matter how the color look like itself. It's important what you can do that with the mixes. Itself, it's look like a, a marker for the kids. So bright, you never see that color in real life. But it's just a brilliant color for mixing. And look, back to the my basic set, what I'm using all the time, this line. Um, I just make a few dots. It will be more easy to explain the idea. So let's start from the Indian yellow. Again, you see how the uh, phthalo green look like itself. But Indian yellow, with that tallow green blue shade, give you a very nice green color. It's like a fields in the sunlight. A more softly yellow color. Here is it. Quinacridone deep gold. With a tallow green, you have more softly nice green color. Quinacridone sienna with the same green color. And honestly, this one, by the way, look very close to the subgreen. So that's a little bit more softly and grayish. Brilliant Pyrene Violet with the same tallow green blue shade. And you have a nice grayish color for the shadow on the trees, on the grass, on the ground. You see, it's a grayish and nice mix. That's what I say, the gray colors is the key for mixing. So all that, yeah, and for sure, uh, if you go into the Caribbean or Cuba, you need that combination. This is the tra transparent turquoise, brilliant. So uh, that's why I say, for me, it's like a rule. So I'm almost never use the colors directly. I'm, I always uh, mix it in my palette. It's uh, just absolutely dirt things. And I pick up, I use the same color, so I don't have to clean my palette all the time. Just, uh, I change it, depends. Uh, I add a little bit more warm, more yellowish, more reddish, but it's always that basic mix. Uh, I say nothing about the moon glow, but I believe you know what is the moon glow. It's a just amazing, brilliant color, but it's very special. That's why I use it uh, mostly not for the mi mixes, but itself just change the moon glow a little bit and it's just brilliant color for the background. So now you see how idea, uh, how my family works. One green, give me a chance to make all the greens what I can imagine. That three, my, uh, my personal primary colors, give me a chance to create any brown colors what I can imagine. And plus all of that will be easily changed, use the truly primary colors. So that's very simple idea how to create the palette with the minimum pigments and be able to mix wherever you want. So as I say, I'm a lazy guy. If I think less than I mix my colors, it's, you know, then you paint and it's more spontaneous process. You just take, took your brush to pick up something and mix it again, change it. So if it will be a lot of pigments for one project, you will be lost. If for each, each project, again, for each project, it's a different color. So if I paint the portrait, I'm not uh, touching the tallow green for sure. 
if I'm going to the Cuba, uh, the phthalo green or forest, the phthalo green will be a big part of that. So uh, if you, uh, from my point of view, again, uh, make the limited numbers of colors for each project, but it will be a right selection. You make your job easily. And plus, because you rebuild your mixes and create your mixes all the time, each part of your painting will be look different. And finally, it will be like a pleasure for eyes. So now you know the idea. That's fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Any questions Thank you, you can ask me. Yep. Thank you. Very nice, Michael. Michael. Thanks for sharing. Very nice mixes, Michael. Michael. I have a question. Yep, yeah, sure. Okay. And when you use a natural white paper versus a ultra white paper, do you change your color hues because of the paper? Ah, brilliant question. It depends of the paper for sure. Like, you know, maybe I believe you know, the Arches company, then they create the paper and if they want to make the extra white paper, they put the white pigments in the fibers. That's why then you paint on the Arches paper, first washing, Sometimes you you will see like white dots everywhere. Yeah, that's make a problem for me. So that's why I don't really like the Arches paper just because of that. And uh, no, I don't change my mix depends on the paper, but I mean, the colors, the colors will be the same. Mixes will be slightly different, but uh, I choose the paper depends on the project. If I want to paint the, uh, the winter, with the snow, with the bright blue shadows from the trees, I'm going to the extra white. If I'm going to paint the Girona in the sunset or Italy, I will go to the natural white paper. So I, I am starting to use the paper and my colors, color mixes will be look slightly different. Great, thank you, good answer. My pleasure. Do you also also use the um, the uh, paper the oh, the liquid paper that Daniel Smith makes? You you had a demo on that. Yes, so, uh, you mean the the ground? Yep. The ground, the ground. Yeah. So do do you use exactly the same mixes and the same colors? And when you use the ground. Uh, basically, yes, because that's the, uh, give me the chance again, as I say, uh, mix wherever I want. So I feel very comfortable with that limited numbers of colors. Uh, just um, depends again uh, of of my subject. So it's it's a very complicated point because some subjects I, I want to uh, keep, if I'm use the ground from the Daniel Smith, I want to keep everything transparent. Sometimes I mix it for the ground special with the gouache. Sometimes in my mix, I add the lunar black to make a granulation. Uh, thanks to uh, Nicolas Lopez, I learned how to use it in the good way. But uh, because I, I, I still use a lot of color mixes uh, for my painting, just for the granulation, a little bit lunar black, you will have a nice granulated effect or yes. But uh, basically it's still the same guy. As I say, I'm lazy guy, it mostly, still mixes. Cannot imagine you are lazy, lazy, lazy <laughs> walking the, the world and teaching everywhere. Oh, mm -hmm. It's a pleasure, it's not a job, right? <laughs> yes. Michael. Yes. I'm Giovanni. <laughs> uh, yes. Have a particular mixes for create, in your palette for create the, the undertones and the shadows in your palette? Uh, could you repeat it, please? I have a particular mixes for creating okay. the, the undertones and uh, and the shadows. Yes, so I, I will show you my basic mixes for the shadows, which is uh, interesting and important. Just a second. I yeah. Think of, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. Thank you. It's a very nice question. So, uh, yeah, because I say uh, the grayish colors is very important. A uh, few basic grayish mixes I will show you. Like uh, 
remember about the cobalt. Uh, it's one of my main blue colors because the phthalo, I use just a little bit. It's very concentrated. It's good to add something, but it couldn't be use, useful like a main mixer. So this is equilibrium sienna and the cobalt. And together, you will get a nice gray color. So it can be more cold or more warm, and that's very easy to do. If you need something a little bit more darker, instead of the uh, cobalt, we switch to indigo. And we have uh, the same nice result. So that's another one, grayish mix, which can be again more colder, more warm, but it's more concentrated. So that's easy way. And yeah, remember it's a transparent mixes, which is great. Uh, by the way, I can give you another one, great example uh, to explain again, my point of view, how we have to think then we use in the watercolor. So this is the phthalo blue. You already know that color is from my set. Itself, it's a not that dark pigment. And uh, pure and violet. And again, itself, it's not that dark pigment. But together, you will got a very rich, concentrated, and nice black. You can see that. So it's like you put one transparent glass on top of another one transparent glass. So finally, it's a very nice black color. You can use, uh, instead of the tallow blue, tallow green, and you will got uh, almost the same dark effect. And you can, I can tell you more, you can use Elysium Crimson, which is much lighter compared to the tallow color. Uh, I mean, compared to the pure and violet. And look, uh, this is the tallow green and pure and violet, and you will see what we get. So that's another one, rich black color. But any uh, Elysium crimson and tallow green itself, not that dark. So that's the, for me, it's a good, the best explanation how we have to think then we make the selection and mixing colors. So just imagine from this very bright and colorful tallow green color, we create that soft, nice and deep black color just from this. So that's miracle. And look, it's really gray. You see that? It's absolutely gray color. More concentrated, it's going to be black. So that's the mixing. I'm sorry. You don't worry how staining it is, Michael. Ah, Stella, thank you for that brilliant question. Look, that was, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that was the point why I'm stuck uh, absolutely on the Daniel Smith, because uh, I like the phthalo pigments. But uh, if you use the phthalo from other, other companies, uh, you couldn't take off the pigments. They're so going deep inside the fibers. But Daniel Smith pigments, you can wash out. That's the things. You almost never use like a just of tallow pigments. You always mix, use it for the mix. But I can show you how easily you can take off, lift uh, the tallow pigments. And that's, uh, that's another one miracle. So let's take the same tallow green, blue shade. As you know, it's very concentrated, really stunning pigment. So here is it. And ta-da! Yeah. I can clean it like absolutely white paper, finally. It's possible. But believe me, that's possible only with the Daniel Smith. Schminke, Windsor Newton, all the pigments, it will be on your paper forever. But that you can mix, uh, you can take off. The same with the tallow blue colors. Here is it. Tallow blue green shade. And again, you can wash out. 
And uh, the lifting or washout, it's a big part of my technique. I'm using this a lot. That's why in my old dot list, you will find the Viridian. And I use the Viridian uh, for many years before I'm discover what that's what we can do with a tallow green blue shade because it's more clear, more transparent, more nice color compared to real Viridian. And before the tallow blue green shade, I use the Prussian blue. But the Prussian blue, I'm still using these times to times, but compared to the Ftalo blue color, it's uh, it's look like a, with a dust a little bit. So grayish, not that colorful. Yeah. So yeah, that's just so bright and brilliant. On Facebook, we have some questions also for you. Sure. This is Anna Marie. And the Facebook questions are, do you use white and black paints in your painting? And uh, no, but, do yeah. you mix colors on paper or in the palette? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, never use white. I have a paper. Uh, as I say, I'm a lazy guy, you know. Plus, uh, I like the transparency. You know, it, that's why I choose the transparent pigments. Then I paint, even if I make the dark shadow, and if we see the paper inside that shadow, the light is coming through your shadows and make it like a shiny light inside the shade, which is very nice. That's why my color is transparent, and that's why I never use the white. Uh, from my point of view, then you use the white uh, on the screen. If you scroll the Instagram, it's not visible. In reality, it's very visible. It's it's not the shiny light from your paper. And I never use a black except the lunar black uh, for the granulation. Uh, I mix as my black because uh, I never I never need like real black dark. But you saw how to how easy to make the black. I always need dark gray colors, but it's always different. And right. that's why for me, it's more easy to mix them and make it more interesting compared to use it directly from the tube. Excellent. More questions? Okay. Good. So yeah, uh, thank you for the, you know, it's still, uh, I see in the chat, it's still old dot card with, a, uh, I switch some colors and stop to use them. Uh, so, and by the way, if you starting to talk with uh, uh, other artists, what I did before then I create my own palette, it's very interesting. Almost all the artists use three, four, not more basic colors all the time. Like me, uh, my my primary colors, Pure and Violet, Green and Green, Sienna, and Indigo, all the artists doing the same. Three to four favorite colors, which exist almost in each mixes and plus some different colors to add to that basic colors primary colors so that's interesting uh but depends of the style depends of the personal test and preference it's always slightly different colors for sure but all almost all the artists use the basic mixes that's interesting i have a question yes I'm sorry, I came in late. Uh, okay. Could you could you list your your primary colors for me again? Yeah, sure. It's right here. Uh, first of all, uh, the real primary. It's colors. actually in the chat, Michael. We yes. we the uh, color okay. listing. It's in the chat now, Car uh, yeah. Carol. I think that was Carol Noel. Okay. Yes. I'm just very, very fast to repeat it. Uh, Indian yellow because it's 100% transparent and colorful. Right. A little crimson, tallow blue green shade. And this is my primary colors Queen of Green, Sienna, Pure and Violet, and Indigo. And from these okay. guys, I create my all the brownish mixes. That's beautiful. Thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you very much. That was very nice. Thank you for opportunity to share the idea. So I'm always happy to do that. Thank you. It was great. We'll be doing that um, each week. A brand ambassador will be going over their dot card and doing very similar to what Michael did today. So thank you very much. Thank um, you, Michael. It's fantastic, yeah. Michael. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. You're awesome, Michael. Thank you. And so I want to show you a couple lady. of... I want to show you a couple of things, then we'll go and use some of Michael's colors to do um, some mixes, et cetera. 
So one thing I'm asked quite a bit is um, the blooming. Some of you call it blooming, some of you call it some other things, but essentially it's surface tension. So the one thing about watercolor, you're working with some of the most complex uh, chemistry and physics that exist. One of them is evaporation, which you're always trying to deal with as a watercolor. So the other one is surface tension. So I thought I would show you surface tension. I think this will work. We'll see if it'll work. Yeah. So this is black pepper. <laughs> and the black pepper is floating on top of water. And I can take my finger, so long as I take my finger, I put it in, and ah, I got pepper on my finger. So the surface tension is really, really high. And that's why a mosquito can walk on water. And that's why this pepper is floating. If we take some of this magic fluid right here, magic fluid is, is um, Dawn dishwasher soap. And if we put it in, we can decrease the surface tension. If I put pure, pure Dawn in, it would all go away instantly. But you can see it now floating to the bottom because I'm breaking the surface tension. So this is one of the main things that you deal with as a, a watercolor artist. You're dealing with surface tension all the time. That blooming effect is nothing more than surface tension. And so that was just show you that kind of easy what surface tension is. Then what I did is I went to Ron in the lab and I took some colors. So this is going to be hem hematite genuine. And this one is... Hands a yellow medium right here and right here. And I did a one to 10, or he did a one to 10 for me. It's great having a cheap chemist. <laughs> and so what I'm gonna do is take a pipette and what Ron does in the lab all the time is he'll take colors and you can take a color and put it like that. And then you can take another color. So that's hematite. And this is Hansa yellow medium. Okay. So the yellow ran into the hematite. The yellow has a higher surface tension than the hematite. If they had the same surface tension, you would see a black here and you'd see a yellow here, and they would just touch each other, but neither would invade. So it's it's probably more work than you want to do to figure out surface tension of the pigments, but this is what's going on when you're having those blooms. It's one, one, one pigment, one color, has a higher surface tension, and it's invading the weak one. You can see how it's really invading this. Can you talk to us about how this works over time? Because I know the watercolor pigment doesn't, the paint doesn't stop moving until it's dry. So how do we calculate that in? Because I see the piemontite is also coming into the yellow. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to try to calculate how things are going to, it's more of just concept. Um, it's things you'll learn over time, of course when you paint, but it's, this is gonna also be how, this is a one to 10. It's gonna behave differently, you know, if it's if it's um, disproportional. Um, as it dries, I mean, you're having, that's the neat thing about watercolors. I mean, you're having so many things happening. You're having absorption or, you know, differential absorption of the pigment into the watercolor paper. And that's gonna depend on how much, how much sizing you have on it and what type of sizing it is um because that's going to stop the surface tension as well because instead of going this way it's also going to suck down so just lots of things going on when you're a watercolorist and it's it's just one of those things that i think makes you as watercolors there's an there's an off factor from my my standpoint is there's so many things you're having to try to figure out all the time in doing this thing that people who aren't watercolors should say oh that's just watercolor it is it is complex um, how fast you can paint before something evaporates, what type of uh, substrate you're using, um, how much water you're using. It's, it's, it's incredible. So 
I find it very awe inspiring. And these are questions I get asked. So I thought I would just kind of show you kind of what it looked like. This is why you're getting blooms. And it's different on every day too, depending on what the weather is too. It could be you different know? days. It's going to be different in Florida than it's going to be in Arizona because you're also dealing with humidity and humidity is how you're dealing with evaporation. Yeah. You have, you know, 10 water molecules in the air and 10 leaving the paint. It's really net great, net gain of zero because you have as much as much moisture on the paper because you can't get rid of it. So it's pretty incredible. I mean, what you guys go through is pretty incredible. Jonathan, it really speaks to me. Yes. John, how does the um, the transparent ground, how does that affect or how does the paint affect? When the transparent ground, when you do the watercolors on it, how does that affect what we're talking about right here? So you would have, you would have, you're having several variables. The first two would be the two paints, right? And how and and are they equal surface tension? Does similar surface tension? Does one invade this one, or does this one invade that one, or do they just stand together like this? Then you would look at the watercolor ground. The watercolor ground is going to behave somewhat like paper, and that's going to be absorbency. That's going to be how much it brings the paint into the paper. You have to bring the paint into the paper somewhat. Um, if it's too much, you, you get maximum absorbency. You, you don't get the beautiful color. Um, but if you don't bring it in, then it's like a plastic and you'll just wash off your, your paint. So the different particles are going to behave differently on how fast they're absorbed into the paper as well. So just lots of things happening when, you, when you're dealing with watercolor that you just learn over a lifetime. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's pretty fast. John, Yes. In my studio, we encourage, I encourage my students to learn their push and pull colors by mm -hmm. doing a similar experiment to what you've done in That's their so testing. Cool. And, and they can understand where they want that effect because they understand what color is going to push and what color is going to pull. That's cool. I think if, if children were shown watercolors or art in general, they wouldn't be scared of physics. They wouldn't be scared of chemistry. It'd be more of a, oh, I wonder why that works the way it does. It would be that beautiful um, thirst for knowledge. So I'll, I'll do another one. If you want to see another one, this is going to be French ultramarine and pyrrole red. While you're doing that, John, that's French ultramarine. Would the ultramarine act different? You know, only slightly different because the particle size is, oh, one's about four microns, one's about eight microns. So not, not hugely different. Ultramarine. Somebody asked me uh, earlier that the, the chemistry that goes into making a particle for watercolor is just intense. John, what is that ratio of water to pigment there? One to 10. Okay. <laughs> that was oh fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's also a way that we used to, back in the day, we would test different um, inks and different solvents and oil colors to see how, how they would um, do the very same principle. Anyway, that's kind of how you're getting those blooms and um, it's the process. John, are your chemists artists as well? Um, Ron does Ron does artwork. Ron's, Ron's actually pretty good. Um, uh, prior chemist that we had, they were also um, very good at, um, at art. The majority of the... Um, manufacturing group um does art actually they do very very nice art so at one time i had up to 150 employees and probably 100 and 148 were artists um because you need artists to be able to talk to other artists it's the best way to, to get across ideas etc and a company that is um, art related draws people that love art as well I don't remember criteria, anyone. Just, I don't I'm remember sorry? anyone not being an artist at Daniel Smith. Yeah. So, John, 
here's Sabina. Uh, I have a question because paper is uh, important for effects and the okay. pigments are important for effects. And I think water are important for effects too, because yeah. it's when you when you cook water or you have just water, uh, normal water or you have salty water. You know, so in the lab and in manufacturing process, we always use distilled water. Um, oh, yeah. As a watercolor artist, any watercolor, any water will do. If you can use distilled water, all you're doing is reducing the number of variables. And you already have so many variables to begin with. Um, if you can do that, that's fantastic. Um, but you're right. And my sister lives on, uh, on, uh, on acreage. And she has a... Uh, a watercolor uh, or water pump. So her her water is different than mine in the city, which has more uh, chlorine in it. So mm. those are those are all smaller factors. Um, in fact, somebody had asked me what ha what happens. Does is there any negative? So I'm not going to recommend or not recommend it, but I asked the chemist and I asked our outside chemist, is there any issue of using alcohol? Because I know some of you use alcohol for effects. And mm -hmm. what they told me was there, there, there's, there's no negative effects. So I'm not going to promote it or not promote it. It's just sometimes you ask me questions and and I, and I want to ask the uh, our outside and inside people about them. And they said there's no issue with that. And the other one was salt. And they said there's no issue with uh, with salts. Um, there is huge issues with acids. You know, if you used, um, you can try it yourself. Just make sure that you know whatever you do, you don't destroy it. Um, you could use acetic acid like vinegar or something and put it on the watercolor. The watercolor, many or something stronger, and the watercolor will disappear. Uh, acid is really bad for watercolors. Um, is is this okay. also true? You're commenting about salt and alcohol. Is this also true over time for those of us that are wanting our watercolors to last 200 plus years? Ah, uh, you know that because the, salt is corrosive for fabric over time, and yeah. the paper we use is 100 percent cotton. And that's why I said I'm not promoting it. It's just a question I asked. I, my my brothers would say that you 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 don't do it. Um, if you just use the gum arabic and the and the the watercolor since they're rated and we test those those will last you know 100 plus years if they're that rated um, i've got one for you john yes i think i lost you I think I lost everybody. Was it Laurie? No, there I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. So I missed the question. Can she has bad connection? I have a question for Michael while we wait for her to yeah. join. Um, Michael, I noticed in your artworks that I can always see your beautiful palette weed through all of your paintings. Do you recommend an artist staying with a certain palette like you have? Uh, <laughs> great question. Thank you. So uh, my advice for all the people who build uh, your own palette, uh, everybody have a different preference and test. Can you imagine Alvaro Castagnet without neutral tint? That's impossible, <laughs> right? Yes. But I don't like to use the neutral tint for mixing, for instance. It's not my favorite co color for mixes. It's just, I, I use this color a lot, then I make a black and white sketches, for instance. That's great. So my advice, that's why I'm starting from the uh, real primary colors. Yeah. Uh, that's what we definitely need in our palette if we want to be able to make all range of color mixing uh, around us. And plus, after that, uh, select your favorite colors, what you really like and try to understand how that colors mixes with the, your primary colors. And one by one, you add another one, your favorite colors and check how it's look like together. If it works, if it can be part of the family, you can include it. If not, uh, try to another one. 
still you will find uh, what with a minimum uh, set of the colors you can create wherever you want. For my point of view and for my test of the color vision, uh, my set is perfectly balanced. I like it. it's transparent. And I, again, as I say, I can create wherever I want, but that's the difference between one artist and another one. We have a different feeling of the colors, different vision and different tests. So everybody selects something different. So it's normal way. Thank you. And thank you so much for the cobalt blue and quinacridone sienna gray mix. <laughs> it's my favorite gray now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it really works uh, perfectly. Uh, it's, uh, make very soft and nice gray color just like that. Very simple. Yeah, very balanced gray. It's not too cool and not too warm. Very nice. Thank you. That's right. Michael, what's your opinion about uh, papers? that uh, work the best with Daniel Smith colors. I know these, uh, we're talking about the bright and the, the bright white and the regular white um, and everything. I understand that just in general, um, most okay. teachers start you on arches, but then I hear uh, other uh, artists talking about Fabriano and um, I've been experimenting with Kilimanjaro. And I was just wondering what, what you found was work best for you? Okay, it uh, uh, depends, uh, again, what project you create. Uh, if you need a very soft gradients, very soft mixes, not very bright. From my point of view, the best paper, it's for sure, we're talking about the extra white. Uh, it's the Saunders Waterford. All your color mixes will be really soft and nice. If you need a bright colors, colorful mixes, the best solution from my point of view, Bauholk Masters paper. Yeah. You will have a very bright colors. It's just so bright, like exactly what I use today for examples. Uh, this is the Bauholk Master paper. Yeah. Um, the Fabriano, from my point of view, it's a problem paper because it's drying so fast and hard to control. It too much glue inside. The Arches paper, uh, as you know, the uh, extra white uh, arches paper make a problem because of the uh, white paint inside the fibers make the small nice dots sometimes it's very nice special effect but if you don't looking for that uh, it's not good for using so in my advice uh, we have a bauhonk master paper or we have a saunders waterford after that number three arches uh, arches is better for my point of view to use the natural uh, uh, whites, not extra white. And after that, I don't know the really good paper, except remember, as I yeah. said, it depends on the project. Sometimes I switch to uh, Fabriano uh, rough paper if I want to make the very fast sketch and I need the bright colors. And I don't want to make like a soft gradients painting wet on wet or something like that so it depends on the project as always can you can you uh spell the first part of the master's paper uh Bob Hulk master's paper here is it so you can okay. see okay brow hong okay like chinese yes just All uh, right. huh. remember uh Bao Hong master's paper and Bao Hong. uh Without Masters Regular, it's a two different paper, like a Fabriano Artistico and not Artistico, it's a different paper. So, okay. Thank you. Have, have you tried uh, Hanemule, Michael? Yes. Uh, again, personally, I like it for sketches, but definitely not for painters. Not really. Lana Guarel? Um, you know, except the, the brands, what I say, uh, I like the uh, French brand uh, La Hoc, but it's uh -huh. imp almost impossible to find that paper. If you go to the website, uh, mostly you see the uh, the message, it's blocked because it's unpaid, which is funny. Uh, and you couldn't find that paper in the stores. You have to go to France for that. But La Hoc, uh, it's a good paper from my point of view. But mostly it's that's it. So all other paper, very specific for the very specific job. For regular painting, Saunders for the Fort, Bauhong, Arches. That's it. Michael, it's the Bauhong 300 pound or, or 140? 300, uh, no, 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 uh, 140, 300 grams, 140 pounds, yeah. 
Thanks. Michael, like yeah. you like you say, I guess uh, once uh, you have found a paper that you have liked and like your palette, you stick to your paper that you like. So that's what I'm getting from uh, what you're saying. You know, you experiment with a lot of papers, and once you find the one you like, you just stick with it more or no, less. No, 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 no. Uh, pers personally, all the people are different. Personally, I'm a hunter, and that's why I'm trying to all the time find the new papers, new pigments, new brushes everything what I see around me, that's how I discover in the bow hole, because if I stuck on my favorite Sanders water fort, I never find that brilliant paper. And uh, five years ago, my main blue color was ultramarine. And all my mixes was uh, on the ultramarine. Uh, for now, it's a cobalt. So we, uh, we are growing up, we change our test, it's a normal process, it's never stopped. If you use the same colors like uh, 10 years ago, that means you stop growing up completely, just stuck on one point. Which the the watercolor world is growing so fast that Daniel Smith created different pigments all the time. And uh, it makes sense to try it and check. It can be, again, part of your family. Maybe it's some someone interesting you can create from that. The papers, the brushes, everything is it's so a life world, you know. In oil, the same was uh, 200 years ago. Nothing happened in watercolor almost each month we have something new which is really really cool mm. a lot thank you michael, michael. great answer michael, have... Hi, michael. listen to me michael have you used cellulose um, paper and what do you think of the difference when it's got a cellulose back um product within it uh what kind of paper sorry again a cellu cellulose so oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, no, and no. <laughs> no, that, that's simple. Again, for sketching, if you mix, like, for instance, the watercolor with the marker, with the ink, brilliant. Uh, you can paint the real watercolor on the cellulose paper uh, anyway in the traditional style or mine style because it's drying just in a few seconds. Uh, if you like, put uh, a lot of layers one by one, uh, without give you a time to blend your colors on your paper, you can use it. But uh, no, it's 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 very nice cheap paper to make an experiment uh, to test your colors, and it's very nice paper uh, for the sketching with the ink again. But for painting, no, no. I have a question about uh, yes. the alizarin crimson. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that permanent lizard and crimson or, or the classic, which has a reputation for fading? <laughs> yeah, I, I know that story. <laughs> you know, I, I use the classical lizard and crimson. The permanent lizard and crimson are so stunning, it's very hard to lift that pigment. But the story, what the lizard and crimson going to lost the pigments in time, you know, it was maybe like that 100 years ago. For now, the technology is completely different on the different level. So nothing happens with your pigments for now, except for sure if you put it directly on the sunlight. But you know, if you put the oil directly on sunlight, you kill your oil painting as well. So no difference. Nobody put your uh, artworks on the sunlight without protection. So nothing happens with your paintings. Nothing happens with my paintings with Elysium Crimson. But again, compared to the permanent, it's very easy to lift. That's why I use this one. Classic. Thank you. How Hi, about hello? Uh, I think I have something to say about the paper. I know that somebody it doesn't agree with that. I know that Nicolas Lopez is in the room. <laughs> different painters, <laughs> different opinions. <laughs> yes. are, you, are you there, Nico? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Yes, he is. Hi. We saw him. <laughs> yes. Hi. Yes, we listen to you. Yes. What do you think about the, the cellulose paper? What is your Hi. opinion? Hello, everyone. Hello, Michael. Hello, John. Hello, yeah, yeah. It's very uh, big uh, words uh, talking about for the paper because it's um, so, so many possibility about uh, the, the, the feeling in the water, this, the pigment. This. The, the material inside the paper, you know, it's a different brand, different uh, 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 direction of the 
of the materials. I don't know. It's a totality different any paper all the time. I'm talking same, same, same. You, I think same to Michael. It's um, uh, any situation depending to project. It's necessary if you use yes. one special paper. In my workshop, for example, all the time uh, talking about this, uh, all, all all the time uh, the students. And it's possible to take any paper, different paper, too much paper, not only one exact paper. I recommend, of course, two or three papers for my our works, but all the time taking different paper for the testing, for comparison, for 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 recognize the process of you of your possibility more or not, depend of you of your feeling in the in the in the in the, in the work. Uh, I know it's so in the in the in the in the market. So different uh, brands of the paper, different quality, different uh, level of the cotton or, or, or glue or gelatin. I don't know. So totality different. Any paper, all, all the time. I I talking about this. It's it's more important. What are you feeling? What is what is you uh, necessary in your project? You know? When you like it atmospheric, okay. You can one sounders. I recommend sounders for atmospheric because it's very cotton, special cotton, you know. Uh, in, and for different another point, the depend of the student, it's uh, maybe like it more uh, uh, transparent, more light. Okay, why not? Uh, one uh, extra white paper in arch, in in sennelier, in in Hanimuli also, you know, for the practice. For the for the comparison for understand more, but of course in the pro final project is your decision. It's it's very uh, maybe talking every night about paper, but it's it's completely it's one word very very big uh, all the time. I recommend enjoy enjoy and testing 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 mm -hmm. testing. This is the more uh, more important process for you recognize your paper. What is your uh, feeling? Watercolor water in the paper. The, in three words, so totality different open possibility, you know? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> I enjoy this. Nicholas, Nicholas, yeah. is your Bao Hong paper mix different from Michael's Bao Hong paper mix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my paper. <laughs> my <Yay>. paper. <laughs> well, that's the same. <laughs> yeah, no, I think same. it's the same. I think it's the same. Oh. Different cover, no? Okay. Yeah, different cover, but the, the inside is the same, of course. But yes. uh, okay. I like this one because it's very, very um, uh, flexible, and the pigment granulations working very, very interesting in this paper, for example. I love it. Uh, it's, of course, using many water, too much water for 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 uh, for flexible. You know, I I see the ex uh, about uh, John and yellow. This uh, tonality is exactly. I'm using too much water for this. Mixes natural in this paper, it's perfect for this uh, process, for example. You know, it's very, yeah. very interesting. Nico, it's great to have you here. Thanks so much. Um, just a quick check, we are over time now. Let's br bring John's frame again. Uh, it's here. Hey, well, <laughs> <You're on. laughs> thank you, Nicholas. <laughs> I hope to see you in uh, Taiwan. Maybe, maybe I'll see you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That'd be I'm fantastic. I'm in Paris now. In Paris, and I stay in Paris now. Uh, I have a demonstration tomorrow. After tomorrow, here uh, of about uh, Daniel Smith in in one store, uh, very important in, in Paris. After tomorrow. <laughs> fantastic. Now I'm staying in hotel. Relax. Yeah, yeah. And maybe see you in in in, in Taiwan. That'd be fantastic. Michael, Nicholas, Michael, great discussion. Thank you very much. It's good seeing all of you. Michael, thank, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you tomorrow. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.